Okay, let's get started. So uh, welcome everyone. This is a Soroban design discussion. Uh, in these meetings, we discuss uh, some of the uh, core decisions that we need to make when we're building Soroban, which are, uh, is a platform for smart contracts uh, that uh, is in active development right now and is being uh, integrated, integrated with Stellar. Uh, today, we're talking about Auth Next, which is a proposal that Dima put together um, to address uh, some of our authentication and authorization needs on the network. Uh, so I think that without further ado, uh, this is the second time we're talking about off next. The first time was before the holidays. A lot of folks were uh, were were out. So I think we're going to start with uh, an overview by Dima, uh, then dive into questions, and uh, ideally we'll be able to uh, make a decision. Uh, or get close to a, close to that decision today. Uh, so Dima, can you take it? Yep. Hi everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We can hear you. Okay. So, sounds good. Thank you. Um, so uh, a quick overview. I will probably skip on the motivation for the sake of time. Uh, I will just say that the general motivation is that we aren't. Uh, too excited about the uh, state the office currently now. It's a bit too fragmented and too limited in some senses, while it's too flexible in other cases when it's not necessary. So uh, this proposal tries to build something into the protocol um, that would be both uh, flexible, but also standardized so that contracts can interoperate and uh, the client software can um, implement certain things just once uh, without uh, tweaking them for every contract. So on a high level, the proposal consists of two big components. Uh, the first being account abstraction and second being standardized uh, signature payloads and invocation authorization. So uh, quickly on this point, uh, account abstraction is a somewhat well-known concept uh, on, uh, in other chains. And the basic idea is that instead of passing some entities that are tied to some uh, crypto algorithm, such as uh, some public keys or something like that, or instead of tying all those to say classic server accounts, um, we make the contracts to operate on some abstract entities called accounts. And from the contract standpoint, account is uh, just an object that has uh, an address that can be used to store balances, for example, or store any account related information or transfer balances to this account. And it has a way to authorize. Uh, the invocations of the function. Uh, it's not uh, the contract uh, in the contract business logic how exactly the account does that, so hence the abstraction. And the accounts themselves can be implemented both uh, in a built-in fashion, similar to our built-in token, and the built-in implementation will cover the classic store account, so they will all get their default account contract, right? But they also can be customized, right? For example, if uh, someone comes up with a new uh, crypto algorithm, like this is quantum resistant, for example, right? Or, you know, there are hardware wallets that currently don't support Stellar at all. It is possible to write uh, an account contract that will perform this custom authentication, but the possibilities are much wider than that. It is possible to have arbitrarily complex multi-six uh, schemes that are probably currently uh, not possible with the classic store accounts. For example, it is possible to require different multi-sig um, for uh, different tokens spent or different balances spent, or basically anything. This is a smart contract. I guess that's uh, the bottom line of it. Um, so yeah, this is the first component. And um, the second component is uh, about the signature payloads, because again, currently signature payloads is somewhat freeform. We have like the 
SDK implementation of some structured payloads, but this is just in one SDK. It's not standardized in any way. Um, so the proposal here is that uh, instead of uh, relying on contracts to uh, define their own signature uh, payload schema, we provide a generic one that should hopefully be flexible enough to fit all the use cases. So the payload obviously would include some uh, context information such as uh, network uh, ID. Uh, but the main thing and the main innovation here is that instead of just signing a single contract call, um, it is possible to sign a whole tree of calls, or even like forest of trees in a general case. Um, basically, um, from the contract standpoint, when the contract requires an account to authorize uh, some invocation, uh, the Thorban host, like the core will um, add uh, this into a call stack uh, of authorized calls and build a context out of it. So basically, when authorized is called from some contract, uh, the payload for this call should contain, uh, obviously, the currently executed contract and function, but also the call stack of the authorized invocations leading to it and the contract provided arguments. So basically, the only thing that the contract needs to provide is the uh, arguments uh, for the uh, authorization, and everything else is inferred automatically based uh, on the current uh, call stack and stuff like that. Um, the proposal also uh, includes uh, the generalized nonce management. I, I think we wanted to dive deeper on this, but for the sake of overview, the idea is that uh, host will contain, uh, will, will manage nonces per contract and per account address so that uh, basically neither regular contracts nor account contracts need to worry about that. And this comes with some benefits like uh, nonce can be consumed only for the top level invocation and not any subsequent subcontract calls. Um, which is generally uh, less ledger access and more flexibility for the users. Uh, there are other benefits. For now. Um, so these are two key concepts. And um, I think another uh, interesting high level point is that thanks to uh, how things are standardized, um, for the cases of complex contracts, uh, pre flight can be utilized uh, to build this, uh, the signature payloads. Um, this is like, like when we are talking about the contracts that have more than a single signature, like in the current world, or more than a single authorized invocation in the uh, next world, um, it may be tricky to figure out like uh, what exactly needs to be signed. Like the contract may maybe delegated to some contract that dynamically depends on the user input and things like that. So uh, in order to figure out um, what exactly needs to be signed in order to be able to execute a certain contract call, um, we introduce a mechanism in pre that uh, will basically trace all the authorization calls and build the proper payload. And uh, the cool thing here is that at this stage, like there is no signatures participating and basically no no commitment to any security reasons from the user. So the only thing that the uh, pre flight needs is the uh, as the addresses of the accounts that participate in the invocation. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it on the high level. Um, I think like, like there, there is a bunch of other things, but I think we would want to uh, dive deeper into them. 
Yeah, I think that's a great starting point and we can open it up for questions. I'm especially interested in the perspective of the DAP developer. So Paul, Tzachi, if you have any comments there, uh, I think that the original auth that we built uh, or what we now call advanced auth, the, the point in which we realized it was uh, a bit problematic is when we had you know DAPs and walls try to implement it and it became clear that it, it's, you know, it's a lot to handle. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear uh, about this from the DAP perspective. Could you, Dima, talk a little bit more about what actually goes into the signature payload? Specifically, like, do wallets have to sign uh, only the subtree sections where, like, account the authorize is called, or do they have to sign every, like, cross-contract call, or...? Yeah, yeah, as I've mentioned, basically, the uh, trees of the calls are not, like, the full trees of whatever the contract calls. Um, basically, this is... Uh, uh, subset of the whole call tree of the contract versus the uh, current account, or oh, not current account, the account we are interested in or try this something. So let's gotcha. say we have an account A that uh, wants, uh, so, sorry, we have a contract A that wants a user to authorize it, then it delegates to contract B that doesn't authorize the user, and then B calls C that does authorize the user, and that Call stack the user signs is A and then C. B will be omitted. Cool. So, you know, so like there is a... no, uh, yes, there is no spam in a sense for, well, yeah. like it seems much more flexible, right? It, yeah, well, that's okay. So, for like a exchange swap, for example, you would really only have to sign like the token withdrawal from your wallet. Yeah, sort of. Well, like basically, yeah, you need to yeah. still approve uh, your token to some router contract and then yeah. router contract can route your token in any direction or vice versa. Like you may uh, sign like some low level swap operation that just swaps you with someone and you don't really care how exactly this is being routed. Again, your signature is required on this bottom level operation. So both ways work. And also an important note on signatures um, that I haven't mentioned is that wallets would sign the hash of the whole payload and this is mostly for the sake of compatibility with whatever hardware wallets and uh, uh, possible feature scheme. Basically, we want to bound the uh, signature payload size, uh, like the actual signature uh, payload size, not the pre -major. Yeah, so the wallets take the entire subtree, hash that, then sign that, so there's only one signature. Okay, cool, thank you. Yes. Uh, Dima? Yeah, I have a question about, and I'm going to steal a uh, Liz questions. Uh, what, what in the case that you want to pass an invalid signature to one of the subcontract with the purpose of taking a different path in the co in the contract execution, right? And explicitly, you want to fail one of them. Yeah, th this is a uh, weird case. Like, I mean. Uh, I'm interested to see like an actual use case for that because um, from the like, like this only influences pre-flight, right? From the pre-flight standpoint, like I described this feature where we can record the authorizations, but the side effect of recording them is that we treat them all as successful. Um, it is not impossible to mock failures in the pre-flight API. It's like basically not a protocol change. I'm not convinced this is something we actually should do. And uh, it's really unclear to me why would you ever want this to be the case. Basically, uh, in my mind, uh, like it is fine for the authorization failures to be recoverable. Um, for example, you know, you want to clear like multiple trades and at once. And uh, in a general case, trades may not clear for multitude of reasons, one of them being that signatures for the trades, uh, for, for this trade are incorrect. And you don't want, for example, to fail other trades if you're just batching things together, right? Uh, this is a fair case, but I think uh, this case is only meaningful during the on-chain execution. Uh, I think it is fine for the pre-flight, for example, to execute the happy scenario, because it will be uh, probably 
it will consume more gas and will access more ledger entries than uh, do it in case of failure. So it will be like a superset of what is executed on chain. Um, of course, it is possible to write some really weird uh, contract logic that would try to reauthorize the account. But again, I'm not quite convinced that ever a good idea. And uh, there won't be a good support for that from the pre-flight standpoint, for example. And uh, but but I think there is a pretty good reason to not support it because you kind of have this recursive dependency where like you want your signatures to depend on the function input, but then uh, if your signature defines like what the signature should be, you get this basically cyclic dependency, right? Um, so I yeah, I'm not convinced this is a good idea. Basically, like what I would want contracts to do normally is that um, if you call contract function with certain arguments, it comes with a certain signature payload, and this relationship should be deterministic, right? And it should not involve uh, signatures in the input, um, which is actually one of the problems with the current advanced OS because we are like are uh, we used to like include some information from the signatures uh, while building payloads for another signatures and uh, it's pretty messy and uh, hard to maintain and parse so yeah yeah and another question this change implies that you need to do the cryptographic verification post transaction execution right at the very end Right, because you need to build the pre-image, and in order to build the pre-image, you need to run the contract, right? So not on the uh, simulate side, but when you actually go and execute it, you need yeah. to run the entire uh, smart contract tree, right? And only at the end, you have the pre-image that you can verify with the signature. Uh, that's actually right. not true. Right, like it's a bit of an implementation detail and uh, I think it may change, but in the current prototype, um, what happens is that since we kind of decouple authentication and authorization, um, mm -hmm. well, well, at first, the whole tree has to be passed uh, in some way along the transaction, right? So the transaction should know in the first place whatever is your claiming you have signed. So from the smart wallet perspective, for example, it's possible to examine the whole tree it's trying to authorize. From the authentication perspective, there is just this third payload, which is a hash of something. And from the authentication standpoint, the only thing we need to do to it is to basically verify if the signature of this payload is correct and uh, in case of multi-sig accounts, find all the signers, right? Um, so basically, in the current implementation, the authentication happens lazily the first time the account tries to trace something. Um, and actually, the same goes to evaluating the whole uh, tree of the calls in the vault. Like, the latter part may or may not change, but I think, yeah, there is really no need to delay anything until the end of the contract execution. We just um, do verification as soon as possible. So basically, if like, like if something is not like, like if somewhere deep in the subtree there is a cause that hasn't been authorized, we'll find out about this as soon as we reach this point, but not sooner. I see. So the entire tree is effectively submitted as part of the transaction, right? Yeah, it is. And uh, yeah, I, I have seen your suggestion on the doc that uh, maybe instead of passing like uh, the whole tree explicitly, we may pass hashes of its nodes, which uh, probably may be fine in terms of the transaction side. But yeah, it, it really only matters for the uh, transaction mm -hmm. part of the thing, um, yeah. not for the actual execution. Yeah. So my concern here is that people are going to use the existing contract uh, infrastructure to develop like deep executed a uh, cont contract tree, right? And when that happens, we can have uh, several hundreds of contract 
executed, right, per transaction. And I just kind of like uh, horrified of the idea that as a result of that, we're going to have hundreds of signature in each uh, transaction right? no, no, no. for the same uh, account. So again, there is only a single signature per account, right? And that like the signature flow is you take the payload, which is basically a network plus a vector of the invocations you want to authorize, mm -hmm. you hash it, you sign the hash, that's it. Uh, so there is only a single signature. Then the first time, at the execution time, the first time the account tries to authorize something, we verify the signature. Um, and then we will just do basically matching like whether this uh, invocation is present in the tree or not. Now, uh, to the deep tree topic, I don't think it's uh, it's any real it has any relevance to this because it's not like it's impossible to call such contract now. And uh, the advantage transfer to this is fees, right? Uh, like you cannot probably execute a hundred of contract calls even if they don't do any authorization just because you will run out of gas before that. Like we are going to have gas limits on the transaction, so. Um, and uh, I think it's completely orthogonal to us. Like, it, it, it will always be a better idea to have a single contract than a multiple contracts, than multiple contracts to do the things. And uh, because calling a contract comes at a cost. So, yeah, it's like a uh, very different issue. Yeah. All right. Take a demo. Um, can I give us a question about the, the to do with this, you know, what gets signed and the subtrees? Um, and going back to Dima, the example you provided when you uh, when you were answering one of Paul's questions, um, uh, you described a situation where an account uh, is signing, um, like the, the, you're calling a contract, and that contract is calling three other contracts A, B, and C, and this account just wants to sign uh, the call to contract A and the call to contract B. Um, in that situation, is that does that mean account A signs two subtrees like separately? So they provide two signatures, they sign A and they sign B, or are they, because a few times it's been mentioned that an account only ever provides one signature. Is there some way that somehow they sign those two subtrees, but it's only one signature? Or how does, how does that work? Yeah, so basically, uh, as I said, like technically uh, you're not signing the tree, you're signing a forest of trees. Um, so for example, if you have a top level router contract that doesn't require any authorization, but then you make two subcontract calls that are authorized, that would spawn two call trees, right? Because they will have different top level authorized nodes, um, which I think is fine. Like you still need just one signature over that. Uh, that said, I'm always saying like one signature per account. Uh, account here is an account object uh, it doesn't mean like that it's unique. So if your transaction accepts two accounts and they happen to be um, to have the same address, we won't try to deduplicate them and then there will be two signatures. So, you know, when I'm talking about like sing single sing signature per account, that's only in the context of that account. Like in the context of the whole transaction, there may be a return number of accounts and some of them maybe duplicates and uh, they will have their own sig the signatures too. So uh, we don't try to be any more clever here. So it's yeah, one per okay. account, not more than one. Okay, so in that, in that situation where uh, account one wants to sign contract A and contract tree, uh, C, but they don't want to sign the top level, like the very, very top level uh, contract call, they they would provide two signatures. They would sign like the subtree for contract A, the subtree for contract C, and then they would include those two signatures. Um, is that is that right? Okay. So at first, I want to make point that I think it's more like it's important to correctly say that it's not that account wants to do something; it's what the contract wants to do, uh, because the source of the signature payloads in the first place is the contract, it's uh, not the account. Account role is to uh, verify the signature, like an account contract can 
account in a more broad context role is to sign stuff, right? And then verify. So basically, depending on the code tree, you will get different results. For example, if you have a contract, as I said, that calls independently into, say, contract B and contract C, um, but you provide it once at the top level, you'll get a single payload. So let's say you have a contract A that doesn't require authorization itself, but it uh, does call into contracts B and C that do require authorization. Um, if you provide contract A, then you will get a single payload uh, with both invocations. But uh, on the other hand, you could um, just pre-sign contracts B and contract C, and then write, uh, like you don't want to know the user to know about your top level contract, then your top level contract will take care uh, about having two different accounts, right? But it will be still possible to forward the signature. So basically it's uh, whatever the contract defined and whatever you try to pre-flight or build signatures for, it's uh, driven by the contract interfaces. Um, so, I mean, it's probably a good idea to try to implement things in a way that um, only a single signature is needed so that, you know, we have some atomic operation per account that may involve arbitrary number of subcontract calls, but uh, uh, nothing limits you from, you know, using okay. multiple presigned uh, calls, but you will need to uh, this needs to be reflected in the contract interface and implementation. That's right. Awesome. So what you're saying is that um, contract A could just sign the entire tree if they wanted to. Yeah, like you, you would need so, to so provide so contract instead, A. It's, yeah. Instead of, uh, so if you were just, so just ignoring pre-flight for a second, just assuming that the uh, developers here know how to build these trees themselves. They know how to do all the signatures themselves. I'm not really too interested in the automation just yet, but um, a developer could choose just to sign the entire tree and they would be signing A, B, and C. Um, or they could choose to sign just the subtree A and just the subtree C and include those two signatures. Yeah. Both of those uh, basically, yeah, like, like as long as you're forest of trees corresponds to what, what has been authorized, you should be fine. So, you know, if, but basically what you can do, like if you're in full control of all the execution paths, um, you will just look at where your authorization secure and uh, you would include all this into the signature pivot require signing it. And then you basically can embed these sub trees in arbitrary uh, call trees uh, you care about. As long right. as and the, you know, they and, resemble the same topology, and a signature by an uh, a signature on a tree uh, will just mean that whatever the address is for that signature is authorized anywhere in that tree where that address shows up. Is that correct? Like well, no, it's where authorized it's anywhere is. the contract uh, calls authorize on it, right? It's authorized anywhere yeah. the contract requested the authorization. Got it. Uh, so it's still driven by the contract. Yeah. I have a, a question related to this uh, about authorization context and the call stack. So if you in, if you invoke a contract A that calls B and you know, B is the only one that calls authorized, then A is not part of the context, allowing someone to front run A by submitting B. Uh, I'm wondering if there are any security issues or weird use cases here, and if we should consider requiring the full call stack by default the option to authorize a subset of the call stack. And my concern here is a high level, if it's possible for the front run to prevent expected logic from running. Well, the answer here will be, like, like at first, that was a consideration to include like the full call stacks, but the scenarios, like we have just discussed such scenarios, like it's rather limiting and uh, makes use cases like exchanges much trickier to implement properly because, you know, you may care only about like swapping the token and you don't want to care about like how exactly it has been swapped. And uh, as to front running, uh, some contracts would indeed need some front run prevention uh, in place. So for example, you know, 
coming back to the batch in the operations example, right? So let's say your contract clears multiple swaps and the uh, swap may fail for multiple reasons. One of them is run signatures, and other one is front run, right? Someone front runs a swap and it's no longer valid, right? Um, this case is really not different from any other failure, right? Just write contract in a way that it gracefully handles the failures and you should be good. Um, as for security issues, I mean, it is possible to write a contract in such a way that you can front run the signature for it and it won't do uh, the right thing, but it's probably on the contract and it's like an implementation issue, right? Normally, uh, what you should require the user to sign, should be, it should be a, some sort of atomic operation that the user should intend to perform. It shouldn't be some middle step. So for example, if I want to create a claimable balance, for example, a simple thing, right? Uh, I want to transfer the token to the contract and I want to create an entry um, on behalf of this user. Um, I could write this incorrectly and take just the signature for a transfer and you can front run the signature for a transfer, but that's obviously a bug. What I should do is I should require the authorization in the whole thing or use the proof or whatever. So, I mean, bugs uh, would exist for any sort of uh, authorization scheme, uh, but I don't really see an inherent security risk here as long as you don't require the user to sign some uh, non-atomic things that you will build the logic on. So let's say coming back to the swap example, let's say you did something based on the swap outcome, then probably you would want to authorize your top level contract that does the swaps because it does something else that probably need to be outright, right? And you don't want it to be front run. Um, so, so, and also uh, the front running prevention topic. Um, ah, never mind. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So like the what you said makes sense. Like the but the one thing I'm concerned about is you know the the, the authorization authorization context is, is determined by the contracts, right? Like as you mentioned, uh, and the user is just going to sign whatever pre-flight returns. So, and, and these bugs are not that like you know if you don't have a great understanding of how uh, this authorization that these authorization mechanics work, you you may not see it when you look at the contract, and the user is just going to sign whatever pre-flight returns. So it may not be you know at any point easy to see what the issue is until until it's too late. Um, so that that's just my concern. I don't know if uh, well, I, I'm still I mean, not sure if this is. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I know my intuition is that again, this is probably the case for any sort of authorization scheme. Like, let's say you even sign the whole tree. Like, do you really think that adding like a bunch of stuff to the tree would like prevent some weird uh, cases when you sign something that you didn't intend to sign? I'm not sure. Um, but I, I think a great thing that structured payloads allow is it's it should be easy to implement a generic wallet support for uh, just parsing this tree and finding the relevant code. You know, like if you send something to the exchange that it's supposed to sell some token A for you, and uh, you get your payload and your wallet says, "Hey, this is going to withdraw like ten x of the token A that you actually wanted to trade." then you know you probably won't find this and like you wouldn't worry about this too much um so yeah there is definitely like more control from the user standpoint um in a generic scenario i agree that uh, some things might be vulnerable and user wouldn't know about that but i mean yeah i i don't have a good understanding of how prevalent would this be or how dangerous would this be um, because, well, it sort of could be contracts that are flowed in multiple ways, right? And you wouldn't know. So it's, I guess, the question of trust and, uh, you know, only using the things that matter. And uh, yeah, the fact that we at least can easily know what the contract tried to do to your tokens or whatever other commodities you have, um, it's already a big win here. Um, I guess yeah, it kind of limits the impact significantly. Yeah, thanks, Dima.
Any further questions? Lee? Yeah, I, I have a question, but I, I, it's it's a little bit derailing. So um, I feel like I want to, if anyone else has questions that are more along the line of what we're already talking about, that might be best to do first. You're all away, Lee. <laughs> um, so I, I'm interested in, in how the proposal interacts with uh, the simple invoker auth case that we we currently support today. So um, I think when Tomo was describing it before, you know, we developed the current version of Sorob and auth. We realized that it's actually relatively um, complicated to use, and so then we went and added, added invoker auth, which is basically the same as message.sender in the Ethereum world. Um, and the way that it's implemented is the source account on the operation is the invoker. And so a contract can just say, who's the invoker? And they'll either get back an address, they'll get back an address, which is either the source account on the operation or the contract that's calling them. Um, yeah, so I, I understand that the proposal basically says, okay, there's basically the proposal replaces the complicated and the simple auth we have today and creates a single unified interface that contracts use to um, verify that the, the address is authorized. Um, I'm just wondering like if there's a way that we can retain the simplicity so that for the vast majority of contract uh, Inter wallets and contract interactions, uh, they still have the simplest form of, in terms of like what they need to sign, it's like the simplest um, without needing to go and sign these call stack trees. Well, I mean, the call stack tree for the case that is currently uh, an invoker case, it's pretty much equivalent to just the contract invocation. Right, because it consists only of a single invocation, and uh, you know you just add a vector around the thing that already exists. Um, so even even if that call has like, uh, so I, I might be calling just one contract, but that contract may be calling five other contracts as a part of its what it's going to go do. Um, those calls may be unimportant to me, so maybe they're just calling out to an oracle. Again, some information. Um, again, non authorized calls are not included in the payload. Like, this is an important point I want to reiterate again. The, what, what the user signs is only the authorized subset of the whole call tree. So it doesn't include even any if, in between or side calls. Hmm? Even if the authorized call is the top. Layer. So even if I'm like I, uh, the top call is going to be authorized, and then there's yes, going to be some that, calls that aren't. Authorize doesn't propagate anywhere. Authorize means that authorize this and only this matters in the current context. And that's it. It doesn't say anything about any side invocation. So it, of course, would not contain things that are not done on your behalf. So whatever the contract calls into, uh, doesn't matter for the sake of signature. So for the case where invoker is used currently, I mean, invoker cannot be propagated currently, right? You cannot uh, forward the invoker to the other contract, which actually, uh, as I have seen from the discussion, it's uh, kind of a bit annoying and confusing, right? Because you may sometimes want to propagate it. But yeah, this aside, like in this exact use case, when you don't propagate the top level account anywhere, the signature payload will be almost exactly the same module as a bit different structure, right? Instead of like having a single contract and invocation, you will have this put into a vector. And um, that's pretty much it. And you will have a signature field in a different place. So, uh, you know, from a that perspective, uh, it will be marginally harder to build this payload, but, you know, it doesn't need to account for anything new. It will just need to use a bit different structure that's it. and uh, from the transaction side savings standpoint like uh, we are keeping the uh, invoker signature to like save on signatures and you know if the source account signs the whole transaction and the contract call 
uh, it is possible to mark that it is an invoker and um, do not require like a second signature. So the optimization part stays there too. And uh, yeah, the only thing that kind of changes from the contract interface standpoint is that, yeah, you need to pass the account explicitly and you need to call a Trizon account. We may or may not introduce some sugar in SDK to simplify that and uh, make it so you don't even need to type what you want to authorize. But, you know, it's like one line of code. Um, I mean, you may still want to do this for the sake of like explicitness, but um, I don't think it's uh, too big of a, an issue to uh, basically do this. But on the other hand, like, uh, it is now possible to forward accounts and do things on behalf of accounts in the sub calls, which is not possible with invoker current, which I think is beginning. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot more much from my, uh, yeah. yeah, I think uh, I think an optimization, like if if there is some way for us to retain an optimization where the source the source account could still be used to authorize. Um, I, I guess the because I'm not really too concerned about that one line of code that a contract has to add. Um, I'm more concerned about what that the story is for a, a DAP or a wallet developer. Um, yeah, for the transaction, number, you... number of things I need to sign, like uh, like a you know like a hardware wallet needing to sign the Stellar transaction as well as this blob, which is like two signatures. Um, so two rounds of signing they need to go through versus yeah, yeah. if the, if 99 percent of contract calls really only just need that source account you know they really only then have to sign just the transaction once which is yeah simple. yeah yeah i think you definitely want to preserve that it's uh i agree that for for the signature cases when you know you pay for the transaction and you close this urban contract it's definitely easier to uh just since invoker did so basically yeah it doesn't go anywhere um but it will be possible to do everything with a single signature um how frequently this will be used compared to something else we don't know yet because we have discussed a lot of cases when you know some third party pays for the fees but you know that's something you gotta see but, you know it's a case for the user to just send a transaction to do something it will still be there and this multi-op transactions hopefully it will be possible to sign multiple operations at once uh, while still being compatible with what's next, which I think is good. Are there any other questions, either from anyone on the stage or the audience? I have a uh, minor question that maybe, like Dima, you can you can uh, explain. Like in the prototype, why is authorize called authorize instead of something like verify authorization? I think that was done intentionally, but I, I don't recall the reason. Um, I no, I, I don't think there is reason. I just okay, short enough. I yeah, I mean, authorize is like yeah, I don't know. Exactly like that. That is actually confused. Account quite a few people. authorizes current invocation, but if it's confusing, we can use whatever name uh, we find suitable. Um, could okay. be called verify authorization as well. Check. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so I think there's, um, yeah, I think the the last one we touched on, which is having to sign multiple payloads uh, for the, even for a simple case, uh, I think that's a no-go. I think we need to either optimize for that um, or, or scrap this. Uh, at the end of the day, people are using external signing applications, people are using hardware wallets. Um, and we need to figure out for the simple use case uh, how to sign a single payload. Um, yeah. 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 So yeah, definitely. That, that, that stays. I'm yeah. I'm not saying this is going to go anywhere. So 
Uh, simple use cases will be possible, but you know, for to the complex use cases, you may end up needing to send two things. But yeah, yeah there, I think uh, when, when you say that, Dima, do you mean the simple use case would be satisfied by just keeping the existing invoke or auth capability, or are you meaning that we would introduce an optimization into this proposal so that the contract still uses the same method. They still call dot authorize or dot verify authorization. Yeah, nothing changes. It just some, the somehow comes from the the source account. Yeah. So basically, we don't really like, like the the whole uh, driver for this uh, proposal was to kind of have unified account. Uh, oh, sorry, unified contract interface. And uh, you know, I find it kind of problematic that you kind of hard code your contract to use. Invoker, right? If you don't use uh, advanced mm -hmm. host, the current approach, and uh, that's kind of bad, right? Because if you want to use this in a different context, you cannot. It's hard coded to use Invoker. Um, so the contract interface itself uses what's next. It uses accounts and addresses, uh, hence the abstraction. And uh, you know, one of the implementations of the abstract account, uh, even though it's kind of built into host, but it's just Invoker auth, right? It's just one of implementation of the abstract account. Contracts shouldn't worry about that. It's all implemented in the host and it's in the current prototype as well. Um, so yeah, uh, still there. And uh, by simple use case, I mean the cases when there is only a single account that needs to authorize uh, operations. You know, if there are multiple accounts, then one of them can actually can be invoker, but others need to pre-sign something. But they won't need to sign the third transaction. So hopefully, you know, for majority of the cases, only a single signature is needed. So just to be on the same, this is implemented in your host prototype for Authnext right now. Yeah, it's in the prototype right now. So this is an important thing. And And is the way that that works that uh, you it's only the top level contracts that if they call dot authorize they would see the source account as being authorized? Uh, yeah, they, they actually will see like like basically the tree stays there in the transaction payload, but instead of passing the signature, you pass nothing, and instead of passing the account ID, you pass the flag that this is an invoker. It's similar to how we handle Invoker currently in advanced OS. It's just moved to the transaction structure itself. Um, right. I, I'm just wondering because Invoker today uh, is only has no depth. Like yeah, now it has more... depth. Yeah. Now now it will have depth because the transaction has the whole uh, tree of the code. So basically, you are signing the tree itself, which is why it is safe. I guess to... so. This the way the way it's currently implemented. It's not really message.sender, it's uh, like the transaction.origin from Ethereum, it sounds like, is the way that it's working. I, I'm not sure, but I think the key factor here is that you explicitly, you still explicitly authorize code, right? It's not like you just uh, gave uh, color, uh, contract blanket permissions to call things on your behalf. Uh, it is really just skipping the signature verification part because you when you are signing the transaction or operation, you are also signing the whole uh, authorized call stack uh, payload uh, that uh, we've been talking about before. So yeah, so basically, yes, the wallet would need to show you that, hey, as a part of this operation, you um, maybe assigning multiple uh, Token operations, for example, right? But uh, you know, from the uh, signature standpoint, it needs to still be signed just once. So it's basically like MSG that sender, but better <laughs> because like MSG the sender is like contingent on the fact that you have signed the top level invocation. Here you sign uh, all the invocations that you need to authorize. Okay. Yeah, I'm the reason I just mentioned the the transaction at origin is because I'm just trying to think of if there's uh anything that we really need to worry because it feels a little bit more like transaction dot origin in that you know you could you're you're the source account, you call 
this contract, it calls another contract. You tell that other contract that you're authorizing as the invoker. So that other contract is authorized with the top level source account. Um, yeah, but this I will be reflected in the, yeah. yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think it's probably fine because you're, you're right. It's reflected in, you still have to yeah. specify yeah. in yeah. the tree Basically, that it's yeah. the invoker. Yeah, right. There is really no way, no matter what kind of authorization you use, and there is no way to somehow hide the subcontract code that prepares authorization. So there is really no way to hide some token withdrawal somewhere deep in the tree. It will still surface no matter what, or it will just fail because you haven't signed it. Um, yeah. Any other questions from the stage of the audience? Okay, so I think uh, you know Dima's done a, a great job at answering all these questions. I think there's a still um, most of the concerns are around the you know what is the contract for the DAP, DAP developer, and to get insights into that, I think we need to regroup and probably come up with some. Uh, you know, minimal prototypes that help us understand that. Uh, so hopefully that's something that we can put together um, soon enough and uh, discuss again. And if no one has anything else they want to ask or to uh, add, then I think we can call it a day. Uh, Tomo, Tomo, can, can you hear me? Yes. Maybe if you have a few more minutes, I have one question. It's yes, uh, Chibo here. Uh, Dima, about the uh, non-replay protection, if a transaction fails because the um, call stack change, will the nonce be consumed or not? Yeah, the, the nonce consumption is actually a uh, tricky thing. Um, you may need to think more about that. Uh, in the current implementation, nonce is basically tied to the top level authorized call, um, which may or may not be the right thing to do. Which means that if something fails, uh, basically, okay, if the whole transaction fails, uh, the ledger state is completely rolled back. So the nonce won't, um, won't be consumed. If a top level contract or try succeeds, but uh, some subcontract call fails, uh, and the top level contract handles is gracefully, then the nonce won't be reverted. So it will be okay. consumed. Okay, we, we, we may need to discuss this further because this can be an issue if, like, at some point, uh, a transaction fell and then becomes available again because the call stack is available again. Someone can just front run you and replace the transaction. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I mean, the transaction replay, but, but basically, again, front run is kind of weird because it's. It shouldn't be an issue most of the time because someone would do what you wanted to do anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, but what, what you wanted to do at one point may not be what you wanted to do in the future. So let's say I want to transact with one with one inch to spend my money. Then this fails, so I spend my money with another exchange, and then someone replay the previous transaction. And spend my money again. But the nonce will. Nonce should have. Uh, like we can discuss this more, but basically, yeah, okay. um, yeah, I think like I think this kind of brings another topic, which is expiration, which uh, I don't think mm -hmm. we have discussed, and I didn't do anything in the proposal. Um, it may be a generally useful feature to have, you know, for your. Um, signature to have expiration, and this even could be a part of the standard day payload so that we could uh, just reduce expired uh, payloads. 
Um, but yeah, I, I think it's kind of complementary to your question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The nonce could be ledger bonded or time bonded. Uh, that may be a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, we we can discuss this, and yeah, it would be nice to try to come up with uh, basically some tuners and uh, think if uh, they can be abused somehow because. I guess cool. yeah, I agree it's a bit tricky. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Thibault. So we are approaching time. Thank you so much for everyone and Dima, especially for you for uh, prepping this and for answering the questions. We will regroup and update on Discord. Thank you all.